devastate us with your presence falling down and a rushing river draw us nearer holy fountain consume us with you and captivate us Lord Jesus with you captivate us Lord Jesus with you Lord this morning to captivate us with him. Monday I was over here at the church and I come over pretty early and I like to have some time to do a Bible study and pray and then do a little workout and I was listening to some music and I thought of this song and put it on, was listening to it and I've been praying about what God wanted me to preach on this morning and all of a sudden it was there it is right there captivate us what does it mean to be captivated by the Lord Jesus Christ so if you'll turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11 beginning with verse 28 and then we'll read verse 28 29 and 30 Matthew chapter 11 Verse 28, 29, and 30. It says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. All of you take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest For your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, you are speaking to our lives. And Lord, the burden is light with you. And your yoke is easy. And God, you love us so much and you want us to to understand that love and you want us to understand what it means to be captivated by you to be caught up in you to be enthralled by you and not this world but Lord so often to our shame it's the opposite we're captivated by the world and we're not captivated by you and so Lord we ask this morning that you really work on us that you reach down upon us Lord you convict us Lord you confront us And God, you transform us, we pray. Lord, please speak to us right now. In Jesus' name, amen. So much in this life captivates the mind of modern man. We're captivated by the pleasures of this life. We're captivated by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. If you remember when Jesus... He's getting ready to start his public ministry and he is taken out by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness and tempted by Satan. Satan tempts him with all three of these, the lust of the flesh. You can eat, take care of yourself, take care of your body, the lust of the eyes. Look at all of these kingdoms, the pride of life. All of these things our Lord and our Savior was tempted by. He never gave in. But often we are tempted by the same and we give in. Now bringing it back to us and and just examples of things that draw us away 
from the Lord, things that captivate our minds. I think about TV. How many hours can I spend in front of the TV? And the thing about the TV is it's set up to make you do that because you've got this show that maybe deals with this. Maybe it's a sports show. And then you've got a show that maybe deals with building your house and how to do that. And then you've got shows on science, and you can just go from thing to thing. And so the TV can captivate our mind. But the thing today that seems to be even more than the TV is the computer. The computer, I can actually control what I look at at all times, and I don't have to watch commercials all day long. And so we can get on the computer and be captivated by what's going on around the world on the computer or anything, any, any information that we possibly might want. Recreation, sports, traveling, exercise, all of those things can captivate the mind. And I think especially of sports, and this maybe takes us back to TV, Last year, no one could escape the phenomenon of Tim Tebow. And this is not putting Tim down or putting him up, either one. I just wanted to mention the phenomenon of Tim Tebow. If you didn't know who he was and you didn't hear about him every second, you were living under a rock. He won a couple of national championships. He went into the pros with all kinds of fanfare. You would have never known who he was if it hadn't been for sports. We are captivated by sports, recreation, computers, TV, life's duties. Sometimes the duties of this life, our work, it makes, uh, it allows us to survive, but sometimes it does more than just allow you to survive. Sometimes it provides a really good life, and we can be captivated with our work. Oh, I've got this to do, and if I do this, I'll make more of this, and, and we're just constantly caught up and what work brings us. Maybe it's education. There are people who are captivated. They can't learn enough, and so they're studying, and they're studying, and they're captivated with education. Maybe it's politics. The last two major elections will tell you how the world can be captivated with political figures. You can take the first four years, and I'm not mentioning any names, and you can basically destroy the country, and still the people are so captivated with you they vote you in again. We can be captivated by political figures, family. Now, this is where everybody probably stops and looks at me now, Paul. We've got a list. You've got a list of TV and computers and recreation and life's duties. Yeah, we can put that all on the left. But on the right, we'd put family right under God. But so often, we put family above God. And really, family is an excuse to be captivated by all the other things by my work. Well, I'm doing it for my family. Well, you know, all of the other things, I could take my family and put them into those things. We are captivated by the things and the pleasures of this life. But the Bible calls us to be captivated by the Lord Jesus Christ. In the English thesaurus, we find that the synonyms for captivate are enthrall, fascinate, to awestruck, or mesmerize. So we're called to be enthralled. We're called to be fascinated. We're called to be in awestruck. And we're called to be mesmerized by the Lord Jesus Christ and not the things of this life. Now that all sounds well and good, but how do we accomplish that? How do we put this life down here and put God up here, way up here above it? How do we do that? It's easy to say that. But how does that happen? How can we be first and foremost captivated by the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, I believe there are at least four essentials, essential ways to be captivated by our Lord Jesus. We must fix our eyes upon Jesus. We must sense or seek his presence. We must be drawn to our Lord and we must be utterly consumed with Jesus Christ. We cannot be captivated by this world and its system to the extent that we minimize our relationship with Jesus. So let's begin with fixing our eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ. What does it mean to fix your eyes upon something? Now, it's the same thing in, in the version that I'm going to use of the book of Hebrews that I'm going to quote from here in a moment. It says, keeping our eyes upon Jesus. So fixing and keeping the same thing. We're basically focusing on something. If you keep your eyes on something, you fix your eyes, 
your focus on that thing, whatever it may be. But I want our focus, and it needs to be upon Jesus Christ. Hebrews 12, 2 says, keeping our eyes on Jesus. Now, this is the Jesus as the verse I'm about to read. And I'll finish it here in a moment, but let me set it up. This is not the Jesus, this weak, fumbling Jesus that's preached in most pulpits on a Sunday. Most of the churches you can walk into, you will see a weak, fumbling Jesus if you hear anything about him whatsoever. This is not that Jesus that we're to keep our eyes on, that we're to focus on. Let me give you this Jesus. It says the source and the perfecter of our faith. He is the source of your faith. He is what your faith's about. Jesus said that I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. He is our source and then also the perfecter of our faith. We have this word that we love to use uh, called sanctification. Sanctification simply means your faith is being perfected in the Lord. So here in Hebrews 12, 2, the source and the perfecter, the sanctifier in our faith, who for the joy that lay before him. Now what was this joy that lay before someone who's about to die on a cross? Well, his joy was to do the will of the Father. He said that over and over. I'm here not to do my will, but the will of the Father. And it says the will of the Father, of course, endured. It says he endured a cross and despised the shame and has sat down at the right hand of God's throne. This is the Jesus that we're to keep our eyes upon. That's the gospel in a nutshell. That is the gospel. And this is the Jesus that your eyes are to be fixed upon, that you're to focus on. Now in the Old Testament, Psalm 16, 8 through 11, this of course speaks of the resurrection of Christ. And we know this because Peter in Acts 2 quoted from it and also Paul quoted from this psalm in Acts 13. So this psalm is actually speaking of the resurrected Christ. And David says here in Psalm 16, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. Now this Lord is Hebrew and it means Yahweh. I keep my eyes always on Yahweh. With him at my right hand I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Peter, when he quoted from this as he's preaching his sermon, would have pointed toward David's grave, and he would have said, David is still here. This is about Jesus Christ. I keep my eyes always on him. Are we captivated with the Lord enough to have our eyes set, kept, always upon Jesus Christ. Secondly, we must seek his presence. We must sense and seek the presence of the Lord. Exodus chapter 33, verses 12 through 16, and this is Moses speaking. Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. Now I want you to catch verse 14, Exodus 33, verse 14. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Verse 15, then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you're pleased with me and your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? Do you know what distinguishes you as a believer, as a born-again Christian, as someone who has received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, repented of your sin? Do you know what distinguishes you from those who have not done that, those that are lost? What distinguishes you is the presence of the Lord and it says here that all the people on the face of the earth that's how they're going to know that you're saved and that you're different and I will give you rest you're resting in Christ now in the New Testament book of Acts chapter 3 
verse 19, it says, Therefore, repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So the presence of the Lord brings seasons of refreshing, and it brings you rest in the Lord. We should be captivated in, our, in, in the presence of the Lord, seeking his presence always. Thirdly, we need the Lord to draw us near. We need the Lord Jesus to draw us near to him. James 4, 8 says this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, double-minded people. Basically, pursue an intimate love relationship with the God of the universe. That's what that's talking about. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Are you drawing near to God? Are you making any attempt to draw near to the Lord? That's being captivated by him. Hebrews 10, 19 through 23, Therefore, brothers, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus by a new and living way, he has opened for us through the curtain, that is, his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, here it is, verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, our hearts sprinkled clean with, uh, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Again, another passage that speaks to salvation, that Jesus Christ shed his blood, that his body was broken for you, and that you are to draw near, let us draw near with this true heart in full assurance of faith, our hearts sprinkled clean. Jesus died for the cleansing of our sins. Psalm 73, verse 28. Now this psalm could go with drawing near. It could also go with the presence of the Lord. And it says, but as for me, God's presence is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge so I can tell about all you do. Are you captivated by the nearness to God? Are you captivated enough to be near God? And fourthly, we must be utterly consumed with the Lord. Now, I like this. You notice that in the song, being consumed, consume us, being consumed with the Lord. Are we really consumed with him? Now, Hebrews 12, 29, and I wrestled with this all week, whether to leave it in or, or take it out, and I actually X'd it out and wasn't going to use it, but I think I should use it. It really doesn't go along necessarily with this point, but I think it does. So I'm on the fence here. Hebrews 12, 29. For our God is a consuming fire. God's a consuming fire. What does he burn away? Well, of course, this verse is quoted from the Old Testament, Exodus, talking about him burning away all of the wicked. But for us as a Christian, as a believer, the Lord consuming us will wash away, will take away the wickedness that we so much want to be involved with often. He is a consuming fire. Now, the Apostle John was obviously consumed with the Lord, and he said this in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. This is 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. He said, What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, that life was revealed and we have seen it and we testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard we also declare to you so that you may have fellowship along with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. You can see that in just this passage. This is just part of what John wrote and you can see that he is utterly consumed with the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, what we've heard, what we've seen, what we've observed, what we've touched concerning the word of life. And of course, he established in the Gospel of John that the word of life is Jesus Christ. And he says, I have testified to this. I declare this to you, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that you can have fellowship with the Father and you can have fellowship with Jesus Christ. Being consumed with Jesus Christ is fellowship 
with the Lord? Do you really have fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Can you not wait to get into the Word of God and read it so you can have that time with Him? Can you not wait to speak to Him in prayer? Can you not wait to live out what you've learned through His Word? That is being consumed with the Lord Jesus, not consumed with TV or computers or anything else, all of the gadgets that we have in this life, all of the things that we can do. Are we truly consumed with the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you captivated by Him? So much in this life captivates us. It pulls us away from our God and our King, the Lord Jesus Christ. But we must understand that we are not called as Christians to live this way. We are called to fix our eyes on the Lord and to gaze upon His beauty. We are called to sense the presence of the Lord by seeking it. We are called to desire that the Lord draw near to us as we draw near to Him. And we're called to be completely consumed with the Lord. How many Christians can honestly say that these four essentials of being captivated by the Lord are really a part of their lives? I think we could safely say not many, unfortunately. But my hope, my prayer this morning is that we will take these essentials and we will make them the essentials of our daily walk with the Lord, that we may be truly, truly, truly captivated by the Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God, through the song that we listened to earlier, through the songs that we've already sang, through uh, the prayer that we, or the prayers that we have prayed, and Lord, through the message that you have given, God, we see how far we are from this message. Lord, we are so much in the camp of the pleasures of this life and, and politics and, and our work and education. We're so much in that camp. We're so captivated and mesmerized and enthralled, fascinated and awestruck by that, that, Lord, we really don't have much time for you. And, Lord, if we're all honest, Lord, you're, you're down below most of this life for us. But God, we don't want that to be the case from this moment on. We want to change, Lord. We want all of that pushed down where it should be. Lord, those are not bad things in and of themselves. But Lord, when we place them above you, Lord, we have made idols out of them. And Lord, please forgive us this morning. Lord, we are all crying out together collectively for you to consume us with your love, to focus our eyes upon you, Lord, to draw us near, to draw near to us, Lord, to be our God and to give us the fellowship that we all desire. Because, Lord, as Moses said, we don't want to go if your presence is not with us. So, Lord, we pray for that presence. Lord, continue your great work. In Jesus' name, amen. for blessing we pray for peace comfort for family protection while we sleep we pray for healing for prosperity we pray for your mighty hand to ease our suffering and all the while you hear each desperate plea and we do much to give us less 
for days. Cause what if your working come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if all falls asleep to start? For what it takes to know you're near? And what if trust falls as light? Are your mercies in disguise? You pray for wisdom, your voice to hear. And we cry in anger when we cannot feel you near. We doubt your goodness, we doubt your love. As if every promise from your word is not enough. And all the while, you hear each desperate plea, the long that we have faith to believe. Cause what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if all falls asleep to start for what it takes to know you're near? And what if trust falls as light? Are your mercies in disguise? When friends betray us, when darkness seems to win, we know that pain reminds this heart, this is not, this is not our home. It's not our home. Cause what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if all falls asleep to start for what it takes to know you're near? What if my greatest disappointment or the aching of this life is a revealing of a greater trust this world can't satisfy? And what if trust of this light are your greatest storms the hardest nights are your mercies in disguise May the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with all of you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all of you. Amen.